Okay, Tim, you're all set. Take it away. Perfect. So as Mary said, um, feel free to turn off your camera or you can keep it on if you want. And if you have any questions during this or you wanna say anything, we will be stopping at certain points to allow time for questions. And you can always, if you're the type of person like me, where if you don't immediately ask the question, you forget it, uh, feel free to type it in the chat and then we can get to it as we see them. Um, this class is kind of on how to be safe online, uh, some of the different things you can do. Uh, but first we're gonna start off with some things that happened recently. Mary sent me this article. Um, maybe someone sent it to Mary, in which case, thank you. But uh, four-year-old hacks mom's Amazon Prime account and orders 51 boxes of SpongeBob SquarePants popsicles. So I thought it was cool. All right. Um, and hack means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. So one of the things it means in this case is his mom already had everything logged in and the child used the computer. So, you know, hacking may or may not be the correct terminology, but basically what he did was he was doing some schoolwork and the mom, um, the mom let him use her laptop instead of the iPad. And he went on Amazon and bought a ton of SpongeBob popsicles. Um, we can send the, the link in the, in the chat for you to read afterwards, but I thought it was amusing. And this is one of the reasons and an example of why you should not leave things logged in all the time. Because like if you're at a cafe or if you're just hanging out and other people are in the, in the house or if you bring your laptop somewhere else and you walk away, uh, someone can just log on. And if you have anything saved, any of your passwords set to automatically log you in, it can cause a problem like this. Can Another quick, thing, yeah. I had a quick question. Recently, I received an uh, email from someone whose account was hacked. It looked a bit suspicious. I didn't respond to the email, but I initiated another email to him. Does that mean that my email now is compromised because even though I didn't respond to that particular email, I initiated another email to him and his account was already hacked? So whenever someone's email account is hacked, as long as you don't click on anything they send you, you're generally okay. The worst thing that can happen is if the person, if you send an email back to the person, it just lets the person who's in control of the account know that that's an active email address. So they'll add you to whatever um, mailing list they have to try and scam people. Mm, okay. I thought I was safe by not responding that I was interested to you know if he did send the email. So that was a dumb thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> and sometimes um, the account isn't actually hacked. They're just pretending to be sending it from that address. So lots of different ways for people to get you online. And uh, let me interrupt for a second. I'm getting some background um, noise up from somebody. So if, if you're not actively asking a question, I would encourage you to mute. It would just make it the recording a little bit nicer. Thanks. Cool. All right, so can everyone hear me just fine? Everyone muted themselves, so Right, perfect. we're all muted. <laughs> <laughs> I, I picked the, uh, the correct time to ask that question. All right, so the second thing we're gonna talk about before we start anything else is I'm assuming everyone at this point has heard about the pipeline ransomware attack where the pipeline was shut down. We don't fully know uh, how the attack started. Um, but what we do know is somehow um, a nefarious actor got into the pipeline's administrative system, did a ransomware attack, and this caused the pipeline to shut down. This pipeline provides 45% of all East Coast oil and gas. Um, so it caused a lot of issues. And one of the impressive things I saw was Tennessee. This is a 
percentage of stations without gas in the states. So DC, 47%, Florida, 31%, uh, is that Georgia, 49%. You know, you have North Carolina, 71%. So you had a lot of states that legitimately ran out of gas. If you notice, um, New Hampshire is not a part of this. Uh, basically, the coastline, I know it's a small image, the, the, um, the pipeline goes up to as far as New York. Uh, so we weren't as affected in New Hampshire. But still, it's kind of scary that something can happen. Someone can click on something in an email, bring down a company like this, for a couple days only, and it caused this much issue. Average uh, gas prices rose seven percent or seven cents per gallon, which was pretty pretty impressive. Um, when you think about how much seven cents is in the scheme of things with all of the gas stations that were uh, being targeted or affected, so I'm sure everyone or some people saw. Uh, you know, cars were being burnt down because people were, you know, filling up random objects with gas to hoard it, which also contributed to the shortage. But it's just an interesting real world example of why you should be careful. And again, we don't know why or how uh, the hack was initially started, um, the ransomware initially started, but all it takes is one person to accidentally click on an email. I think in this case, it was a software update. So that makes you a bit paranoid too. You think it's a legitimate thing. Um, from what I read, uh, people are positing that a software update could have stopped it, uh, that they had unpatched systems. But uh, depending, on your, um, depending on your software and depending on how you receive the updates, uh, updates can be a vector for ransomware and viruses and all that fun stuff. So really what we're trying to say is you're never safe um, as long as you're online. So the agenda, um, we're gonna do go through a quick introduction. Uh, we're gonna go over must do, should do, nice to do, and we're gonna go over questions. Uh, I will be talking fairly quickly because this is a incredibly broad topic. Uh, you could probably do a four-year or at least a two-year uh, college degree on this. So we're going to condense it down and just give simple anecdotes. And if you have any questions uh, during, remember, please feel free to put them in the chat. And as always, we'll send the uh, recording, we'll send the slides, and we'll send the chat out after the meeting. And if Mary has your information, you'll get all of that information. All right. So uh, first slide is kind of going over a more concrete example than the current pipeline issue uh, where they actually semi-publicly provided all of the incident report after they figured out what exactly happened. Um, and it was Maersk in 2017. Uh, and they were a company with over 600 IT staff and they, kind of, if they have 600 people working IT and they got affected, um, it can happen to you. So, and this was perpetrated because a Ukrainian version of Quicken got kind of taken over. And as was said earlier, a software update was sent out. Uh, someone clicked on it and it infected the entire company. Now, the reason why I really like to show this is the only reason the attack was able to succeed was because they did not have their security updates applied. So if they were using Windows operating systems and they had hit the, you know, whenever you see the annoying pop-up in the bottom left that says, hey, we have an update. Do you want to restart your computer? And you keep hitting no. Um, they did the same thing. And if they had just hit yes, they wouldn't have been able to get infected. Threat landscape. So uh, currently we're not far enough into 2021 to see the proper distribution. So we're still using the information from 2020. And Trojans are by far the largest percentage uh, followed by viruses. And we're kind of gonna go over what Trojan means, what viruses mean, 
um, but we do have links in all of the slides to go over far more, go over everything in far more detail if you want. And the other important thing to look at on this slide is it is going up. It's not leveling off, it is going up. It's not exponential growth. Um, it's fairly linear in my, you know, using my eyes, but it is going up and it's not gonna go down anytime soon. So behavior vulnerabilities. These are essentially things you can do as a person to be more efficient with how you're protected when you're using online stuff and computers. So one example is forgetting to log off. Um, you can, we went over the, the child who ordered all the SpongeBob stuff, and that is an example of this. She forgot to log off of her Amazon account. So the child just went to Amazon, ordered everything, bada bing, bada boom. Uh, the next thing is poor password management. So this is, this basically includes a lot of things. So poor password management can be just using really, really, really simple passwords. It can be writing the passwords down on a piece of paper that is next to the computer, and it can be not using a password at all. Another example is failure to create backups. If you get a virus on your computer and you clean the virus, you're still never 100% sure that the virus or the infection is gone. If you get ransomware, your computer will be basically protected and locked against you. And the only way to get kind of to rebuild after this is to have a backup because it's a huge hassle if, you, if your computer is somewhat compromised, so you lose all your data, or if your computer just dies. Um, so the easiest way to fix this is to just have a backup and we can go over some of the backup options in a little bit. Jim, may I interrupt for a minute? When you say that, does that mean even though you cleaned the virus, it could be still in your backup? Well, what that means is, so if you get a virus on your computer and a malware program, anti-malware program says, hey, you have a virus and it cleans it, it cleaned what it found. So you don't 100% know that there isn't something else on your computer that was added at the same time as the virus. A lot of times what will happen is there will be a virus or some bit of malware that gets into your computer and then it starts downloading all of its friends to the party. So one thing gets on your computer, that one thing brings 10 buddies and your antivirus cleans up eight of them and you think you're good. So I don't wanna like scare people too much, uh, but essentially that's what I'm saying with the backups is if you have a virus on your computer, the absolute safest thing you can do is restore from a backup. So the next thing is to is a failure to check for and apply system and firmware updates. All this means is whenever Windows or Apple uh, say, hey, can you please update your computer? Um, hit that update button. Feel free to wait a day. Uh, that's what I do. I will wait one day or at least a couple of hours before I update my system just to check online and make sure the update didn't brick any computers, didn't you know cause any issues. And generally, you'll see a news article about it fairly quickly. Uh, but as soon as you know that 12 hours the next day has come and gone, uh, definitely update, update your system. Uh, firmware updates are a little more difficult to explain, but they're basically, if you have a printer, how it communicates with the computer, um, you can download the firmware updates to make that connection, uh, you know, have any of the security patches that they've added. Uh, one, one printer company that's really good at this actually is HP. Um, so they send out a lot of firmware updates for their printers. And the next issue is the one I'm most intimately familiar with is failure to consult support for help. So if someone gets a virus and they don't really know what to do, sometimes they'll try and, you know, oh, the virus isn't doing anything, so they just ignore it. Or they try and fix it themselves. And then who knows how long, you know, an issue could 
can stay because someone didn't report it. So it's not embarrassing unless it happens like three times in a week. If you're working for a company and they have IT, uh, just let them know. And it's a lot better to let IT know that there's an issue than it is to kind of be embarrassed about having a virus and not telling anybody. It's very important to let, especially for businesses, it's very important to let uh, the IT department know that your computer thinks it has a virus. Plus, I mean, if I think of it like I do a plumber, um, if I have a leak in my kitchen, yeah, I guess I'll try and fix it, but I don't really know what the hell I'm doing. So I need to call an actual professional in to assess what happened and how to make sure it doesn't happen again. Uh, continued examples of behavior, mistyping URLs. Uh, this used to be a bigger issue than it was, than it is now. Uh, but basically all this means is if you mistype amazon.com by one letter, uh, bad actors would buy up those domain names, pretend to be Amazon, and let you check out and steal all of your information is an example. So just make sure that you're typing in the correct URL that you're actually going where you want to go. Um, if anyone remembers, I believe it was 2016, 2015, uh, Iran's nuclear program had a hack that allegedly may or may not have uh, started from the US or Israel. And the way they got into the, uh, into the equipment was they just dropped USB, USB drives in the parking lot and waited until somebody took the USB drive and plugged it into their computer. So please don't plug in a USB drive into your computer. Um, a lot of people will do this just to see if there's a document on it uh, that you know, says the person's name and they can return it. Um, USB drives are really, really cheap. Hopefully someone doesn't lose it, but it is used as a vector to get into your computer. And the last one is clicking on suspect or unknown links and attachments. And we'll go over kind of how you fix this, but if someone sends you an email, don't immediately click on the link, actually look at what the link is going to. Uh, so phishing and spear phishing. These are one of the, some of the more fun ones. Um, phishing is just in general, someone will send out a bad actor, will send out, let's say a million emails and they all say, you know, enhance your virility and you know 20 people are going to click on it well they're sending it out or like 20 people in a thousand are going to click on it well if they send out a million of them that's a pretty good return because it costs nothing to send an email and if they have you know a couple thousand people click on it and accidentally give out their information then they've they've made their money so that's what phishing is is just kind of a generic send it out to as many people as possible uh, spear phishing is a little more delicate and intricate, and they'll actually learn about you and pretend to be, you know, someone who normally has email correspondence with you. An example of this is whenever you're in a business and there's a CEO, and let's say you're in finance, the CEO will send you an email, say, hey, I immediately need, you know, $1,000 worth of Apple gift cards. And if you can just send those to me, that would be great. And if this isn't an odd request, sometimes people will just say, all right, CEO sent it, do it, pay for it, send it to the CEO. And the CEO says, I never sent that. Um, so it's kind of a more specific and targeted attack. This happens more in businesses or if you're super, super um, wealthy, then you get these all the time. I see in the, um, <laughs> in the chat about whitehouse.com, which is no longer, uh, what it used to be, but I will not double check it right now just in case I'm wrong. And uh, that, was, that was a fun one when I was in middle school. I think we, we found that out when we were researching presidents. Nothing nefarious, but yeah, you tell kids who are trying to go on the internet for the first time, go check out the White House site. Okay. Um, so that was very silly of them. The other thing I'd like to go off of that is sometimes there will be promotions that have you go to a website. Um, and sometimes those promotions end, but you can still have the code for them. And other people will buy up those domains and kind of try and steal information that way. The biggest one I 
can remember was Monster ran a promotion. And after the promotion was done, they only had the website for like six months. They didn't renew it. A um, adult entertainment site bought it. And then all these kids were, you know, opening or looking on cans of Monster for, you know, their code, went to the website to redeem the code and voila. So yeah, back yeah. to email phishing. Um, I think I didn't say anything too outrageous in that. No, not at all, Tim. Yeah, perfect. So this is just a nice pie chart. Um, and these are examples of what uh, email subject lines can be that make you click on stuff. Apparently LinkedIn is the number one for this, uh, where people will just automatically click, in, click on something that LinkedIn has sent them. And it's not necessarily LinkedIn that sent it. So these are kind of what scammers uh, feel are proportionally the easiest to use. You're okay then if you're in the LinkedIn website when you get these requests. Yeah, yep. Uh, so oftentimes this can be fixed by, a lot of times you'll see, um, you know, if your bank sends you an email, they'll say, you know, we'll never ask for your password or blah, 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 blah. Um, but if you ever get an email from your bank that requests you to do something, the easiest way to do this is not click on the link they sent, but go to your bank page directly and navigate to it from there to whatever you need to do. So you don't actually want to click on the links. Um, but yeah, LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, Facebook, all this fun stuff. To my, I continually um, get what I guess is uh, spam email. One of them is for ad remover, which, you know, um, which is kind of ironic because that's what I would like to get rid of, the unsolicited ads. But is that in itself? Should I assume that that's not a, not a good thing to open? Yeah, I mean, if, if it's not something that interests you, you can always kind of, I don't know what email client you use, um, but on on Chrome or not Chrome, yeah, it's on it's Gmail. Yes, yeah, Gmail. Um, you can basically just mark it as spam and over time it'll figure out that you do not want this type of email um, or you can just block it. But generally a lot of companies will, for lack of a better term, uh, spam you with emails just to get you to click on something so they can potentially make money. It doesn't mean it's necessarily, you know, they're not a malicious actor, but if they're trying to sell you something, there is the, the, uh, the rationale there for them to continue to send you stuff. Now, if there's like, you know, an antivirus program that I've never heard of that keeps saying, hey, click on me, um, I will we'll definitely report that as spam and ignore it. Um, so these are all, in this slide, all of this information is from no before, uh, including this. And basically what they do is they, one of their main business practices is to have companies hire them. And then they will basically test the users to see if they will click on stuff that they're not supposed to. Um, and these are the top 10 general email subjects that they have had success with. So payroll deduction form, please leave a review. Please review the leave law requirements. So if you notice something is in 2018, this wouldn't have made sense. But since this was in uh, 2020, all of a sudden these subject lines make a lot of sense. So they do change with the times. Because if you look at it, payroll deduction form, okay, that's any time. But leave law requirements, yep, that's COVID related. Mm -hmm. uh, require to read or complete COVID-19 safety policy, yep. COVID-19, yep. Vacation policy, yep. Your team shared COVID-19, yep. Official quarantine notice, COVID-19. So they will take advantage of whatever global issue is going on to make the emails seem a lot more relevant, which I find brilliant and uh, concerning. So we're going to quickly go over different malware types. But before we do, uh, does anyone have any questions over what we've blazed through so far? I 
Yes, you explained everything perfectly. What I take away from is avoid all social media. And yes, I completely agree. Uh, social media is becoming or is the top uh, vector for all sorts of malware. Yeah. So mainly because people have been programmed to click on to get tons of information from social media every day. And they've just become numb to clicking on a link immediately. So it's become second nature to someone sent you a message on Facebook. Oh, okay, click. I want to see yeah. that message. All right, so malware, different types. Uh, we have virus, scareware, ransomware, spyware, adware, worm, trojan. I do have a short description of what all of these are next to them. Um, I'm not gonna read all of them. Um, we're just gonna go right through uh, and I'll stop on a couple. So a virus is the main one you hear about. And basically what makes them unique is they will replicate themselves. So they get on your computer if your computer is connected to a Wi-Fi access point, like in a library, and other people are connected to the same Wi-Fi, the virus will try and go to all of the different computers that it can see. Um, so that's why they're so dangerous, is because one person can have a virus, not know it, take it to somewhere else, and it just kind of tries to spread its wings and fly. Now, businesses should have some sort of protection against that, but the protection isn't foolproof. Uh, this is also why if you're ever in an airport, I always recommend trying to tether your phone uh, to your computer to use that instead of using the airport Wi-Fi, because people can just hang out in an airport all day and just anyone who connects to the Wi-Fi is a new potential target. Trojan, um, they basically pretend to be something else, uh, hence the name. And basically, uh, they're not malicious themselves, but basically they'll get on a computer and then download something malicious. Uh, spyware is a program type that is free, but basically what it does is instead of charging you money to use it, they just steal information or to put it politely, they will track what you do and sell that information. Um, so this is very similar to what Facebook does, um, where it basically doesn't make money because you pay it, it makes money because you use it and then it sells ads because it knows exactly what you've been doing. And spam is just tons of emails, someone's going to click on one of them, good return on investment. Ransomware um, is, the, is the one just like what shut down the pipeline where it will get on a computer, it will encrypt the computer so you no longer have access to it. It will then say, hey, if you pay me $1,000 in Bitcoin, uh, I will unlock it. I do wanna spend some time uh, basically saying if you are affected by ransomware and you absolutely need that information because you don't have a backup, um, it is in their best interest to actually give you your data back. So I'm not saying that if you pay them, you'll get your data back. But if a ransomware, if ransomware is out there and news stories start picking up that, you know, people paid and they didn't get their data back, no one is going to pay. So they actually even will have helplines and they have video tutorials on how to pay. They have a lot of, they make it as easy as possible to pay them to get your information back. Um, now, as always, please don't pay them because it encourages it. But if you 100% need the information and can afford the payment, it is something you can consider. Now, as soon as you get the data back, uh, definitely back up the data and kill the computer and rebuild it completely. Uh, because you never know if they just left something on there to you know, infect you again. Rootkit. Uh, we're not going to go over this that much, but it's basically a more difficult type of virus to get rid of. Uh, do we have any questions on the different types of malware out there? Uh, 
Perfect. All right, section one, must do. So in case anyone uh, didn't get the memo before this, this is a four hour class. So uh, buckle up. That was a joke. This is maybe 20 more minutes. All right. Um, and if you fall asleep, uh, please let Mary know and she can send you the recording afterwards. So software and firmware updates. We kind of went over this, uh, but basically if you're using Microsoft or if you're using Apple, um, whenever you get a system update, please do it within a couple of days. It fixes a lot of these problems because Microsoft and Apple themselves will patch their, their operating systems fairly regularly as new threats emerge so they can stop them. Uh, as an example, the WannaCry ransomware hit more than 300,000 users that were reported in 150 countries and the vulnerability it exploited was patched by Microsoft two months prior. So theoretically, no one should have been affected if they had, if they had downloaded the, the update. And there's a um, good a, question yep. in chat. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Nope. Uh, how do you know for sure that the update is legitimate? So I personally have not heard of an update that shows up on your computer um, for Windows or Mac as not being legitimate. Um, but let me, other programs maybe. So basically, if you go, if your computer says, it has an update, right? Like mine does. What'll happen is if you get an if you get a pop up on your computer, just go to your settings, go to your updates, and see if there's an update. If there's not, it could be a virus that, or not a virus. It could just be a um, an attack through a web browser that just gives you a bunch of pop ups and says, "Click here, click here." But if you go through the operating system to view the update, you know it's legitimate with 99.99999% certainty. So, I mean, if you get an email saying, hey, you have an update, uh, that's not good. But if your computer itself says, hey, I need an update, and you go to the update program on the computer and it says, hey, there's an update, it's legitimate. Now, this isn't to say that other programs like Adobe haven't had issues uh, like this in the past, but as far as Windows and Apple, or Microsoft and Apple are with their OSs, the updates are legitimate if they're coming from the um, if they're coming from the from the company. And you wouldn't use a computer that couldn't be updated. You know, some of our computers are still working, but they're so old that you can't actually update the software. Yes, yes. So there are, um, if your computer can no longer receive the newest security updates, I would no longer trust the computer. So uh, some people consider it forced obsolescence, but at a certain point, um, manufacturers need to stop supporting the older hardware just to make sure that everything runs smoothly on the newer hardware. An example of this, is the Internet Explorer browser where Microsoft basically put in years of work to make sure it was backwards compatible with everything known to man. And it made the browser essentially be really, really, really bad. So no one used it. And then Chrome and Firefox came along and kind of stole all their market share, which is one of the reasons why they just switched to Edge. But yep. Okay. Next part is antivirus and anti-malware software. So um, online, uh, sometimes these two terms get added together to mean the same thing. I personally view them as two separate uh, programs with a very simple characteristic change. Antivirus software to me is primarily for stopping a virus from getting to your computer. So it will block it before your computer has it. And anti-malware software is more for if your computer has a virus, it's really good at getting rid of it. So you can have both of these at the same time. You do not want two antivirus softwares because they will see each other and think that they're a threat and try and kill each other. Uh, because an antivirus software 
basically acts a lot like a virus. It acts a lot like malware to make sure it can't be ripped out by malware. Um, so they will detect each other and your computer will kind of try and fight itself. If you're looking for recommendations for antivirus and anti-malware software, you can go to av-comparatives.org and they basically test all the AV solutions on a quarterly basis. And they put out a report on, you know, what percentage of stuff got through, what percentage of stuff was a false positive. And you can kind of pick the, pick the one you want. Uh, normally, I would click on these links because they're kind of funny about password management, but I'll skip it today, uh, just in the interest of time. But feel free to go through and watch these. Uh, they're basically showing how people are not very good with password management and will literally tell people on the street what their passwords are. So, oops, password management. Um, so some of the bad things you can do with passwords is using a short password, that's fairly obvious, uh, storing them improperly. This means put a sticky note on your monitor. The next issue is never changing your password. Uh, the reason why this is an issue is if for example, Home Depot, when they had their data breach, or Target, when they had their data breach, the attackers got access to all of the usernames and passwords, right? So if you had a password from, I think, 2015 at Home Depot, and you haven't changed it, they still have access to your account because they have that information. So you want to change your passwords, especially if you see that they're involved with a data breach. Um, this one kind of goes hand in hand with using the same password. If your password is stolen in a data breach, because you have a target account, for example, and you use the same username, which is your email address and password on your target account as you do on your banking information, well, basically what they'll do is they'll take that information that they, got, that they gathered from target and just plug it into all the banking websites and see if anyone reused their password. So if only your target account was affected and you don't really care about it, well, if they have your target account, they're gonna test it and all of a sudden they have your TD account. So please change your passwords. Um, the next one is easy to guess. So if, for example, um, there was a study done in Pittsburgh, uh, I think it was University of Pennsylvania or no, it was Penn State. Um, and like 60% of the kids had their password as penguin plus the number of their favorite player. Um, and that's fairly easy to guess. So don't use something like your name. Don't use something like your dog's name. Um, use a slight, make a slightly more difficult password than that. Um, and by more difficult than that, I mean, don't really use words like a big word followed by a number um, isn't the best option. Uh, names, dates, locations, that kind of falls into the easy to guess section. Um, shortcut passwords are far easier to crack. And really, it's not that much more difficult to go from like five characters to, than it is to go to 10 characters. Um, and it's a lot more secure. And we can go over that at the very end where we can kind of show you, um, we can go over that in a little bit. Um, and if you want to know if one of your accounts has been part of a data breach, you can go to haveibeenpwned.com, type in your email account, and it will tell you where it finds it on various data breaches, which is oftentimes concerning. Uh, here, we're just going to go over some quick numbers. Um, a password that is difficult to detect by both humans and computer programs, effectively protecting data from unauthorized access. What this means is um, a computer can very easily guess words, uh, but it takes it more time to kind of guess individual characters. So if your password is only six letters long, it's 308,000 or 308 million different combinations. As you add two letters, that number jumps up significantly. As you add um, an uppercase letter to that, again, a large jump. And if you have eight letters with characters, 
So that's like a dollar sign exclamation point at symbol. The number becomes massive. So the more characters your password has and the more unique characters your password has or unique types of characters your password has make it more and more secure. Um, so how secure is my password? Enter a password. Uh, I just typed in password and it would be found out um, instantly. So let's type in my actual password. Um, yes, that was a flex. So one thing I did when I was in college was I learned a password that was completely random and I just memorized it. Um, so it's the password I use for my password database. But essentially what this means is this password would never be cracked. Um, as we go back down the line, here I will open this up. So, oh, actually I'm just gonna use a different pad. Notepad, edit, font, let's make this big. Okay, so uh, Mary, do you wanna, do you wanna give me what you think would be a good password that isn't actually a password you use? <laughs> well, how about the library Wi-Fi password? Guest one, two, three, lowercase guest one, two, three. So this is the library Wi-Fi password, mm -hmm. copy, paste. It uh -oh. would take a computer one minute. That's... Now, if we just add an exclamation point to that, does it change? 16 hours. OK, right. that's a little bit better. Uh, let's capitalize guest. Four weeks. So you can kind of see how just changing one or two small things really elevates the amount of security you get from a password. Um, should your password ever be guest one, two, three? No, um, but you can make it, you can take a password that you can remember and just add something to it. And then that'll make it very difficult for a computer to guess. So guest one, two, three, uh, when was the library, library built, Mary? 1833. 1833. I can remember I mean, that. It wasn't no built. It was founded in 1833. Wow. Well, either way, that just putting the date mm -hmm. that I associate with the library, three million years, we're good. So, you know, I mean, of, of course, don't use something that can be easily guessed. 1833, mm -hmm. 1833 society mm -hmm. is part of the library. So any library password uh, really shouldn't include 1833 just because it's easy to guess. But this is a fairly long, secure password. And probably um, if you took a little bit of time, you would remember this for as long as you live. Guest one, two, three, I'm excited, 1833, capital G, we're good. <laughs> so that was just a quick example of kind of how to make a password that isn't difficult to remember, but is fairly secure. Um, we have a slide. Uh, this slide was created whenever we were in person and it was supposed to inject some levity. Normally, whenever I said that, I would see people's faces and they would smile a little bit and try and stay awake. Um, but I can't do that anymore, but I kept the slide in. So um, basically what this is showing is how, you know, an incorrect way to make a password if you want to remember it. So Troubadour and three, um, you're kind of going to forget that. And the difficulty to guess is kind of easy, uh, but it's really, really, really hard to remember it. And it's easy for a computer to guess. Um, but if you do something like correct horse battery staple, it would be very hard for the computer to guess it just because of the length and how the words don't really mean anything in correlation to each other. But you're probably going to remember it. So this is an example of how another example of how to make a password that's easy to remember. Of course, I would recommend, you know, adding uh, capital to correct because it's the start of the sentence and adding a period to the end because it's the end and that would just bump up the entropy a lot, but just an example. Um, the only secure password is the one you can't remember. 
that's why I spent the time to memorize a fairly long, unique password. And trust me, it takes a very, very long time. So don't do that. Um, but there are, we've just shown you a couple ways you can make a password that isn't completely random, that's fairly easy to remember. So password management is kind of the immediate segue. Um, I personally really, really, really recommend a password manager. That means you only need to remember the password to get into the password manager, and you don't have to have strong, unique passwords that you remember for all of your different accounts. Um, I know some people don't like password managers, but I consider them essential. And on the right, there's a little example of um, another way to do a, a password that's difficult to figure out, but easy for you to remember, where um, you can have a password quoting something like this. This little piggy went to market, and you basically take um, aspects of that sentence and make a password about it. So this little piggy, TLP, went, all capitals, to, replace it with the number, and market is an M. So fairly easy to remember, but hard to guess. I personally like using uh, Calvin and Hobbes quotes, but for whatever you want to do, Star Spangled Banner, everyone should remember that one. So uh, human generated passwords, passwords should cease to exist. Um, and you should use a password manager. And this takes all of your passwords and puts it in it. And that way you only need to remember the one password as we said before. And then basically there are browser extensions for all of these where you go to a website, you have the browser extension that is your password manager. You type in your password into the browser extension and all of a sudden the browser extension will automatically log you into all of the sites with passwords that you have never seen and you never need to remember, which is really nice. We do have a class specifically on password management that Mary can send to you if you so desire. Uh, the next section is should do, and we are gonna blaze through this, don't worry. Um, implement a backup strategy. So this means backing up your data. Uh, there's two rules that are very, very similar. Uh, three, two, one rule. You want three copies of your data in two different places, and one of those places is off-site. Some people ask me why. Um, you want three copies, so this means one copy on your computer, one copy on a backup device, and one copy on another backup device. Why do you want the second backup device? Well, um, the easiest example is if your house burns down, your computer is gone, and your backup device is gone. That's in your house. So you want that third backup option that isn't affected by the same thing as the other two options. You can use a cloud storage solution for the third copy, which makes all of this a lot easier. And the locks principle is lots of copies keep stuff safe. So basically the same rule. Uh, browsers. The easiest way for you to get infected is just by browsing the internet. And the easiest way to not get affected is to have a browser extension on your browser. Um, the browsers themselves do have inbuilt security, uh, things like Chrome, Firefox, Edge, uh, Safari, and to an extent Opera um, have a lot of built-in security measures that automatically try and protect you. And the other thing to do is if you get a link in an email, you wanna hover over it and it's very difficult for you to see, but on the bottom left, it kind of shows me where I'm going. I'm just hovering over the link to make it appear and disappear so it's easy to read or easy to see. Uh, so I hover the link and it says, the website it's taking me to is www.don'tclickonthat.com. Um, so I probably shouldn't click on it. Uh, the easiest, kind of the useful way to do this is if someone sends you an email, you know, hey, check out this Amazon product. It looks really cool. Hover over it. And if the link doesn't go to Amazon, you know you shouldn't click it. Should you click it anyway? Probably not. But that's an easy way to figure out where 
or what the link is for is hovering over it. If it does not match what it says it is, do not click it. So Tim, we're not getting, we didn't get the, the link showing, but there's a question in the chat about um, Internet Explorer and why not to use it. Sure. Uh, so Internet Explorer, um, you should not use it as your main browser. The issue with Internet Explorer is a lot of programs, um, you know, over 10 years ago were built to interface with Internet Explorer. A lot of things like um, that, you know, unfortunately towns use um, just haven't gotten updated and they need this old support that Internet Explorer provides. So not only is Internet Explorer unable to update itself to the latest security because it needs to keep itself open for these things to work, um, Microsoft themselves have officially given up on it as of, I think, two years ago, and they replaced it with Edge. So Internet Explorer is still available because it has all of this legacy applications that require it to, uh, to in order to run. But in general, it is just slower and it is far more unsafe um, than any modern browser. So if you need to use Internet Explorer, you kind of know that you need to use it for certain applications, but use a different browser for everything else. Please. Thank you. <laughs> um, the next is section in browsers is just some uh, privacy safe browser extensions. Uh, the one I personally use is uBlock Origin. And you can use also something that blocks scripts. The reason why you want these browser extensions, even though what they primarily do is stop ads, is if you think about it, as soon as you see an ad from a website, your computer had to download a little bit of data in order to show you that ad. So if the ad has been infected or if the ad is malicious in any way, you've already downloaded the data to see the ad. Whereas if you use something like this that blocks the ads, then you know that you're not getting infected potentially by ads because you're just not, your computer isn't downloading any information about them. Um, however, some websites do not play well with uh, browser extensions like this. So they all have an option to turn them off for a website if you need to get something to work. But I highly recommend them. And we also had a class on browser extensions and how to install them if you need can help you say with that. A little bit, can you say a little bit about the script blocking? What is that? So script blocking is kind of a more nuanced section of privacy safe browser extensions, and it stops websites from running any sort of scripts. Um, a script could be as simple as you click on this link and it opens it up in a new page. A script blocker will stop that. You want to <laughs> click on something to download it, a script blocker will block that. So they are annoying, uh, but they basically stop anything a website's trying to do. So Sometimes it's useful if you want to be more privacy conscious, but oftentimes it'll just break almost every website you visit. So if you have one of these installed, if you, specifically a script blocker installed, and you go to a website and you're like, hmm, this isn't working properly, uh, you can try it out by disabling the script blocker for that website um, for that time, for the time you want to use it, and try and figure out if that was causing the problem. But basically, they're very similar. Uh, script blocking just kind of is a little bit more extreme. Um, and again, you can always use DuckDuckGo as a search engine. I just put this there because DuckDuckGo doesn't uh, track you like all the other search engines do. And this is section three, nice to do. Uh, password manager, um, I consider it a nice to do uh, because you can technically remember all of your passwords. but uh, the password manager allows you to only need to remember one and then all of your other passwords are safe. Uh, there are different types of password managers. There's the ones that are baked into your browser, um, which I do not like as much as the real ones, um, mainly because if you sign into your browser, your, um, like for example, if you're using Chrome, if you sign into your Chrome account, your Gmail account on a different computer, you'll have access to all of your passwords, but if you forget to log out, so will they. Uh, then you have cloud-based 
password managers, which are like Dashlane, LastPass, OnePassword, Bitwarden. And these are kind of nice because if you are on your computer, you have access to your passwords. If you go to a different computer, you can still have access to your passwords. The next option is desktop, which are applications that are on your computer. Uh, these are slightly less convenient. It's only with KeePass, Bitwarden has a cloud-based and a desktop-based application. Um, but with KeePass, you only have access to your passwords if you're on the computer with the application. So for example, I use KeePass. If I try and go on my wife's computer, I no longer have access to my passwords. The really security conscious person can use a portable slash hardware option, um, such as only key or YubiKey. And basically what these are is it's all this information is bundled on a USB drive, a special USB drive. You would plug in the USB drive into a computer to access your passwords. And as soon as you unplug the USB, you no longer have access to your passwords. So if your computer were compromised in some way, um, if you had the desktop version of something, they can try and crack, even though it takes millions and millions of years to crack one of these things. Um, theoretically, your computer is online, so it can be attacked. Whereas these portable slash hardware keys, um, they are not connected to the internet, so they cannot be hacked in that manner. Um, any of them are good, any of the password managers. Um, I personally use KeePass. Um, it's kind of the original, and it's the one that everything compares themselves to. So if, you know, if I see 10 cars and all of them say we're, Bonda, we're better than the Honda Civic, well, all of a sudden the Honda Civic starts looking pretty good because if everyone's trying to beat them, they're probably the most established. So that's what KeePass is. Um, but it is only on a computer, so it is slightly annoying. Um, and as always, this is kind of a more general, uh, this was a more general class, and we have uh, very specific classes that go into individual sections of this uh, that Mary can send out or, or we'll eventually run them again and you can join. But if anyone has any questions, I'm, I have this booked off for a while more of my day, so. If anyone wants to ask any questions, uh, feel free and I'll be here for a while. So anyone have any questions for Tim? Thank you, Tim. He's wonderful. And you can also, you know, tomorrow from 12 to one, yeah. he can be, he can be your secure, your IT team for you. Um, Tim, if you have a moment, I know you can't really show it online, but can you show, I mean, walk people through what it would be like to use the browser password manager as opposed to uh, KeePass and, and what the steps would be so people sort of understand it? Sure, so we'll go over, um, we'll go over Bitwarden primarily because there's a good free version. Bitwarden Password Manager. Uh, if we go to the main site, we can kind of see the, the pricing. Um, if we wanted to get started or log in, there are options here. We would just hit get started and create an account. Uh, this master password is one that you definitely want to remember. Uh, one of the benefits with Bitwarden is they will not store it. They kind of don't have a way to give it back to you easily. Um, so please remember this. But basically you'll go there and you'll create an account. Now, if I want to install the, the uh, wow, brain fried a little bit there. If you wanna install the browser extension, um, I'm using Brave, which is a kind of, it's a Chrome-based browser extension. So I would go to the Google Play Store. I would find Bitwarden Password Manager on it. And I can see that it has four and a half stars. So people generally like it and it's used by a lot of people. And eh, apparently this person doesn't like it that much, but a lot of other positives. I would hit install. Oh, one sec. Chrome. 
Chrome extensions. Sorry, you go to the Chrome Web Store, Bitwarden, Bitwarden Free Password Manager, over a million users, very highly rated, add to my browser. It will ask me if I want to add it to the browser. It now has added it to the browser. I can see under extensions, which is the little puzzle piece uh, that I have Bitwarden installed. If I hit the pin icon, it will now stay on here. And it wants me to click on it and log in. If I go to my other password manager, which is on my desktop computer, and I put in my Bitwarden account, email address and password and then hit login. It will now log in and I have access to all of my passwords on this browser. So one of the nice things about this is um, you can kind of, I mean, we have a class specifically dealing with this, um, but you can see all of your online banking passwords. Uh, you can online shopping, Macy's. If I just want to go to Macy's, I can just hit this button, hit launch. It will automatically go to Macy's. Um, and if I went to the login page, it would automatically add it. Um, yeah, I mean, if anyone okay. has any specific questions, but that's kind of how to initially download it and use it. Yeah. I didn't mean to set you up for a complicated last moment thing, but um, it just, it's amazing how easy it is to use the browser extensions, the password yeah. manager. And if I want to start inputting my passwords, I can click on it, hit the plus button and start adding passwords in. Okay. Uh, one of the other nice things about them is whenever you're on a page that asks you to create an account, it can automatically create an account for you and automatically have a random long password um, and basically it has access to remember your email address so it can automatically fill out those that information. Great. Well, thank you. So does anybody have any last minute questions for Tim? Okay. Um, well, Tim, once again, I always learn something. So thank you very much. And we will um, upload the recording and send it out. Thank you.